everyone, I'm Rick and thanks for joining me. And if you've been here before, welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be looking at one of the most talked about budget Class D GAN fed amplifiers of last year, the SMSL PAX. If you're looking for a powerful, compact amplifier that won't break the bank, I think this one could be an option. I've been testing the PAX for around 4 months and I'd like to thank Apos Audio for loaning me this review sample. It's been here quite a while, so it's time for this review so I can get this shipped on back. The PAX is currently retailing for $699 US dollars. Alright, let's get started with what we get in the box. The SMSL PAX comes in a pretty nice package. Nothing too fancy, pretty minimal, but great foam padding. We get the amp itself. A power cable. Remote control, warranty card, and a user's manual. Again, great padding. First impressions, this thing is surprisingly compact and heavier than expected, coming in at 5.9 pounds. It measures about 9 and 3 quarters inches across, 9 and a half deep, and about an inch and 3 quarters tall. The build quality feels super solid though. It has a nice matte silver finish that resists fingerprints pretty well. However, the black front panel doesn't on the other hand. The PAX for sure has a premium feel to it. On the sides we have some heat sinks. And this is good as this particular amp does get pretty warm. Class D amps are known for staying cool so I don't quite understand what's going on with this one but it does generate some heat. Moving over to the rear. From the left we have the main power rocker and IEC inlet followed by a set of nice binding posts and our analog inputs, one set on RCA and another on XLR. A caveat here is if you do want to use a PAX as a mono amp, you do have to feed signal via the left XLR only. And no 12 volt trigger on this one. Back to the front panel. The front panel is nice and clean. And after switching on the power rocker in the rear, we'll see a red standby LED light up and then the amp comes out of standby mode. The encoder for volume and menu output is aluminum and it does have a smooth finish. I really would have liked some texture here, but it's fine honestly. On to the menu screen. Pressing on the encoder gets us into the menu and the first setting we have here is amp mode. Clicking in here, we'll see our RCA input, XLR input, and pure amp mono. On this setting, the amp will bypass the volume encoder and the signal will be full power. So when in this setting, you'll want to either use a preamp or a device with some sort of volume attenuation. The next setting is load. And here you can tell the amp whether you'll be using 4 ohm speakers or 8 ohm speakers. Next is a user interface. And here we can select between two, universal or graphics. And here's what they look like. Then we have a dimmer and we can have the screen always on or set it to timeout up to 60 seconds. Next we have the brightness control for the screen and here we have six steps. Finally a reset. So that's it. Pretty simple. Aesthetically I like it. At first I was put off by this offset black panel here but after a while I completely forgot about it and the design did grow on me. Now let's talk specs. The SMSL PAX uses a Texas Instrument PGA2311 for the electronic volume control and Infineon GAN transistors for the output of up to 200 watts per channel into 8 ohms and 250 watts per channel into 4 ohms. The guys at ASR tested this out and they did get that 200 at 8 ohms, however only 230 at 4. In mono, SMSL states 500 watts into 8 ohms. THC plus N is at 0.003% and signal to noise ratio at 115 decibels. The PAX does have overcurrent and overheating protection and it never once went into protection mode in my testing. As for sound quality, I'll remind everybody that I listen to this PAX in stereo mode only and connect it to my Jongsun JA1 preamp with an SMSL DO200 Pro DAC and the new Mpapa Q1 DAC, but mostly with the DO200 Pro and sending that DAC a signal from my Cambridge Audio 851N streamer streaming from my Rune server and Tidal. And the signal from the PAX powering my pretty easy to drive 93 decibel sensitive 
8 ohm three way speakers. Looking at ASR's data, I'd probably stay away from powering 4 ohm speakers with this amp if you want to get room shaking sounds. But with 8 ohm speakers, you're good to rock the house. It was definitely no problem with my system. The PAX is impressive in its super clean and crystal clear sound with a pitch black background. And very similar to the Orchard Audio Star Crimson in terms of tone. The Star Crimson definitely has more authority, but the PAX isn't far behind at about a quarter of the cost. Back to the tone, just like in my Star Crimson review, I'll suggest that this amp would benefit from an R2R source or maybe a two preamp to soften up the edges and add a little warmth if you like that kind of slightly relaxed sound. Now, if you like that very detailed, very quick transient sound, like in a studio setting, then you might love the PAX as is. I found the bass to be excellent in my system. And in my case, the PAX did provide great dynamics. I know my buddy Ed over at Old Guy Hi-Fi wasn't impressed with the bass nor dynamics of this unit. Now he did test on more speakers than I did. And again, I am testing on my 8 ohm speakers that do use ribbon super tweeters, planar mid ranges, and 12 inch paper cone bass drivers. So fairly easy to drive. The PAX did great. My bass cabinets go down to under 30 Hertz in room. And I usually have my preamp connected to a subwoofer. But in this case, honestly, I really didn't feel that I needed any more bass just with the PAX. The bass is fast and tight with great texture. The mids are crystal clear with vocals very defined. The highs were the only part that I didn't love. The PAX does seem to have a slightly rising frequency response when used with 8 ohm loads. So to tame this, I did add a high shout filter set at 8 kilohertz to pull down 3 decibels at the top end. And this definitely made the sound more comfortable for my ears. Now I did do this in Rune, but you can do it with an analog EQ or if you have one of the more modern DACs that have EQ built in, that might be something you'd want to look at. Now at low listening volumes, the PAX sounded great. Very similar to the Ampapa D1 and cleaner than my IOTA VX PA3. But it's when you increase the power that you see the PAX hit another level. The sound stays cleaner than the Ampapa or the IOTA VX. When my preamp's volume hits around 36, the sound from the Ampapa and the IOTA start to compress and everything collapses around 40. And before having tested the Star Crimson a few months ago, I thought that my speakers were hitting their limit. But as with the Star Crimson, the PAX gets around 6 decibels louder before the sound starts compressing. I also tested the PAX without a preamp and with this digital volume attenuation. I had a few viewers comment on other videos and asked me to try the Burson op amps in the Ampapa and compare it to the PAX. They commented that they had great experiences with this. So I pulled my Burson V7s out of my preamp and inserted them into the 3255 based amp. And while this does add a little more detail and widens the sound stage a bit, it didn't do anything to help the Ampapa get closer to the PAX in terms of power reserve. So I do believe that the PAX is going to have more headroom versus most 3255 based amplifiers. At least from my experience with my speakers. That being said, the PAX and the Ampapa for that matter do benefit from an analog preamp. My Jongsan JA1 isn't anything fancy, but it does help add to the layering and increases the sound stage width for sure. The PAX does become flatter and loses some layering when you use it without a preamp and with its volume attenuation. So from my experience, I can definitely recommend the PAX and honestly, I like it much better than my IOTA VX PA3s. And if I had the budget, I'd get a pair of these for a mono configuration to replace those. But I also just made a purchase of a new CD player that I really didn't need, but that one was just calling my name. Guys, I do have a question for you though. Since I do plan to keep on not so much reviewing but giving my opinion on these devices, I think I should get a set of harder to drive speakers. And I'd love to hear what your opinion is. I'd love it if you can suggest something under $3,000 for me to take a look at. Or even better yet, some DIY options. Well, that's all I have for this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.